Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hi, and welcome back to the show. We're up to episode number 58, and this week we've got a, I suppose, a quite a different, really interesting guest. Jeffrey Gray told me that he's a shy, introverted guy, and I suppose it isn't surprising that he went by the trail name of Lona for his 2012 thru-hike. You'd never know that he was shy if you followed his YouTube channel, and he was one of the earlier hikers to actually put up a consistent record of his hike on YouTube. He had an interesting take on that when I raised it with him. Eventually, five years after he had completed the trail, he released a book on his journey, though it's quite a lot more than just a memoir. He kindly sent me a copy, and it's one of those books that you can dip in and out of, offering tips, funny stuff, as well as his hiking memoir. It's called Painted Blazes, Hiking the Appalachian Trail with Lona. There'll be a link to both his book and his YouTube channel in the show notes. Jeffrey's going to be along in a moment. Funnily enough, and this is totally coincidental, I was introduced to Jeffrey by Bruce Matson. Bruce is another listener of the show, and he turns out to be the subject of our new podcast, Returning to Katahdin, an Appalachian Trail Dream. The first episode of this new show is going to be on the morning of Monday, November the 6th. Last year, we followed Jessa all the way from preparation to the top of Mount Katahdin. We're doing the same this year, but now we're following Bruce. While both Jessa and Bruce are lawyers, another coincidence, that is really the only similarity. Bruce is at that stage of life where his career is winding down, though he always seems to be busy to me, while Jessa was just starting out. Jess was an athlete, and while Bruce has certainly done marathons and long hikes, he isn't expecting to be putting in too many 30-mile days. Today, I have a short chat with Bruce that reveals the exciting project that his hike is hoping to be able to accomplish. If you're at all passionate about hiking, listen to what his plans are, because they're going to help you. Bruce will be on after Jeffrey. Last, but certainly not least, Dr. Lynn Savino is back with DocSpot. This week, Lynn is going to be telling us how to treat the various wounds that we might encounter on the trail. Now, I know that some of this stuff should be obvious, but it really isn't to me, so I hope you're all getting something out of these short chats with the doc. Now, let's meet Lona, or Jeffrey Gray. Okay, um, I'd like to introduce you guys now to Jeffrey Gray, or Lona who was a 2012 uh, through hiker. Hi, Jeffrey. How are you? Hey, Steve. I'm doing great. Good, 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 good. Now, <laughs> you gave yourself, I um, understand, this trail name. Why did you give yourself that trail name originally? Well, I gave myself a trail name. First of all, I gave myself a trail name because I knew I was going to be making a video series on YouTube, and I didn't want there to be confusion. I didn't want – if you meet someone on the trail and – you say your name is Jeffrey Gray, they're going to forget it before they get over the next hill. <laughs> so, I feel the same way about Steve Adams, by the way. <laughs> right. So I, I named my channel Loner, 2012 AT. And uh, but the name Loner comes, I've always been a shy guy and hang out by myself. And I've got friends, but you got to get to know me before I, you know, I'm your best friend or whatever. It's funny, you know, well, you know, interestingly, looking at your YouTube videos, you don't appear that way. You seem very confident and and you're talking to the camera like it's your friend. I, I, that struck me straight away as soon as I was watching the videos. Well, that's the way I can communicate. There's no pressure. There's no, um, you know, there's no self-confidence yeah. problems. It's just, you know, I'm just talking to a camera, so it doesn't matter. But um, a lot of other people have mentioned that, too, that. Uh, strange that I'm a loner. I consider myself a loner, but then I would share this whole thing. Yes, uh, yeah, that, that was in, that was interesting to me straight away. And uh, and did you find that when people on the trail learned that that was your name, did they associate that with you? Did they see you were a loner, or did they almost see it as a challenge and try to make you their buddy? Well, I did become friends with most of the people I met. You know, it wasn't like I was trying to stay away from people. No one, no one took the name as a challenge. And they, they kind of understood, they knew that I was the guy that always says hi to everybody, but then goes and hangs out by himself or goes and camps a mile right. up the trail. Yeah. But, uh, no, I made lots of friends on the trail too. Yes. I, I know that, that that's kind of the thing. Well, we'll come back to that actually, but, and I know that you, you do live something of a quiet life and you refer to it as, a, <laughs> this is a great word. You referred to your lifestyle as different when we spoke. 
And in order to somehow give our listeners some context about you know what we're talking about, is tell us how you were living then, and maybe tell us how you're living now. Well, I was back then. I was before the trail, way before the trail. Twenty years ago, I was uh, doing the nine to five, working in a cotton mill down here in uh, South Carolina. There's a lot of textiles. Yeah. And I liked everyone I worked with, and I liked my job, but I just I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand nine to five. I couldn't stand uh, working for someone else. I just wasn't happy doing that. I wasn't happy. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but that wasn't it. And um, I quit, and then I bounced around a few jobs, and eventually I broke my ankle skateboarding, and I couldn't pay the bills. So I'd go to the flea market, and I would sell my vintage toy collection, old old skateboards and transformers and Hot Wheels. And I saw these other people um, living in vans or motorhomes, and they would travel from one flea market to the other. And they seemed happy as could be. And I just thought, well, that's really cool. <laughs> that's the joke uh, for me. <laughs> so eventually when I couldn't pay the rent anymore, that's what I did. I moved into a van. I had a 72 Dodge van. And I would just travel around going from flea market to flea market. Down here, you can sell almost every day. Wow. And, um, Is that all around South Carolina? Yep, South Carolina. And then I, was, I would go to Georgia. I would go to North Carolina, Tennessee. You know, wherever looked interesting and uh it became a lifestyle. It's a whole subculture out here. Yes, I'm sure. So so how long were you doing that for? Or well, how long have you been doing that for? I'm still doing it, yeah. It's been almost 20 years now I've been living in a van, and then I moved up to a motorhome, and then a little bigger motorhome. And yeah. So that's what I do now. I just uh, – That's interesting. I, 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 can see, I can see how that would have uh, – I can see – I see more context really for the name now then. Yeah, I, I kind of understand that. And and you told me that um, – well, I'd like to talk about really how the hike came about. And you told me that you first came to hiking to try to lose some weight and that you started out, and I've never heard this before, of you started out by walking to waterfalls. Tell us about that yeah. and how those hikes became a bit longer. Well, I would go, I would just go to different you know, county parks or whatever and do a day hike or just as long as I could go. And then I found a list of waterfalls. There's a lot of waterfalls here. Yeah. And, I found a list of waterfalls and they would tell you how far they are and what, you know, how big they are and all that. And I said, well, that's cool. I'll, I'll do that. That's more fun than just walking. So I went to a few of them and that was great. And I had a great time. And then two or three of them were a little further than I was could go. I couldn't walk eight miles in and eight miles out in one day. Yeah. I wouldn't make it. So I said, well, I'm just going to get a tent and I'll walk out there and camp at the waterfall. And then in the morning I'll walk back to my truck and Boy, I, that was an adventure then, you know, that I'd never, <laughs> I'd done some camping in Boy Scouts or whatever, but, you know, this was something new to me. So it was really exciting. And did, um, it, did it feel kind of a natural thing to do? Did you, did you feel comfortable out in the woods by yourself? Oh yeah. I've always played in the woods and, you know, I go hiking a lot and otherwise, but sure. I, I felt totally comfortable in the woods. There was no, no problem there. Right, and when we when we were talking about this originally, I understand you then took on the the foothills trail in the Carolinas, North and South Carolina. I think it's about seventy five, seventy six miles long. Had you already decided to go for the AT, and was that your preparation, or was that your inspiration to do a through hike? Well, some of these waterfalls were on the foothills trail. Part right. of it, you'd do a section, and that's how you'd figure it out. When I figured out that the sections, you know, connected together, so I started doing different sections. And then once I did that, I was like, well. I'm ready to do the whole thing. After I did a few overnighters, I'm ready to do the whole thing. Right. And I could walk, by then I could walk 12 or 15 miles. And um, I ended up doing the whole thing with just a little army rucksack and my Walmart tent and a fleece blanket. And, and I got to the end of that trail and I was like, man, this is really cool. You know, this is fun. <laughs> I had a great time. You know, it rained and I was sore and yeah. it was it was a great time. How long did it take you to do? It took me about five and a half days, which usually it takes little you know not that long but because it's not as hard as the at sounds beautiful if it's got a bunch of waterfalls in there as well i would think that'd be a lovely section hike for some people you know 76 miles is a week well five five to seven day hike i would think for a lot of people especially if it's there you know they haven't hiked for some time they go out on the first day i think it'd be a lovely hike to do oh yeah a lot of people in this area train for the at there but you don't have the extreme uh elevation changes there's a few few mountains but not you know, the highest thing is maybe 2,000 feet. So, All right, I see. It doesn't take as long. 
So that was part of your preparation. So once you'd committed to go ahead and do the AT, and by the way, when did you do the Foothills Trail? Was that 2011? Because you did the AT in 2012, didn't you? That's exactly right, yeah. Right, so you were committed to do it. Yeah, you were committed to do it. So how did you prepare for the AT? Well, I, I knew I didn't like the tent, so I had to learn the entire hammock system from scratch because I didn't know a thing about hammocks. And I learned right. most of my stuff by, by Shug on YouTube. He's got some great videos. And I had to learn hammocks. I Believe it or not, I practiced to get used to the cold by sleeping all through the winter with all my windows open. Oh, my I God. Do, <laughs> I know that sounds crazy. No one else yeah, would do, do that. To be fair, Jeffrey, that allow, that does, you're right. I, that sounds crazy. <laughs> I, I would allow myself my sleeping bag and whatever I was going to have on the trail, but I couldn't, you know. Couldn't turn, you know, turn the heat on. I didn't do it every night, but yeah, I did. I did that a lot. And uh, otherwise, the best way to get to practice hiking is just to go hiking, yeah, and camping, and using your your stove and doing your bear bag and all that stuff. It's hard to practice otherwise. That's that's what I would do. Yeah, I I think you're absolutely right. You can't do it until you do it, can you? There's there's virtually nothing that prepares you for this. But what really staggered me and i was i jeffrey kindly sent me a copy of his book which I, we're gonna i'm gonna give a link to the book in the show notes and we'll talk about it in a minute but it's it's more than just a book of his hike it's some really interesting little tips and things about the hike but one of the immediate things that got me was that your total pack weight pack weight rather was only 13 pounds how on earth did you do that yeah well i've always been a minimalist you know living in an rv there's not a lot of room for extra stuff yeah so I'm just used to paring down and keeping things low. Um, the easiest way to keep the pack weight down like that is not to have a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> instead of a instead of a full length um, under quilt for my hammock, I only had a three quarter length. Right. I went in the I went late April or um, early April, so it was kind of the warmest time. You know, it was already getting a little warm. Yeah. I wasn't going in the winter where you need a zero degree bag or anything. I had a thirty two degree sleeping bag. You must have been um, caught some nights in in cold weather, weren't you? I had a 17 degree night at, at a ice water spring shelter. Wow. But I wore all my clothes. I wore all my three layers and I had my sleeping bag and I had my hot water bottle and, and, uh, I was fine. Plus, I don't know if living in, in on the road like this makes, I'm not saying I'm a tough guy, but I can handle uncomfortable situations maybe more than someone who hasn't, who just lives a regular lifestyle. But even 13 pounds, what, what did you have in your bag then? Your bag itself must have been quite light. The bag was light. I believe it was it was less than ten ounces by itself. All oh, right. So um, okay. Yep. And um, I had my three layers, so they were all light. I had an yeah. extra pair of shorts, an extra shirt, um, my sleeping bag, my underquilt, my hammock, and my, my, my hammock was very light too. It was less than a pound. All right. Um, that's about it. I had a little tiny cook kick that I used, and you know, a beer can stove that I used in the beginning and the end. I didn't use it during the middle. Wow. Um. One one thing that is misleading is I did carry my water in my pockets of my shorts. All right. No one else has ever done that in the history of the trail. But no, I shouldn't have think um, so. <laughs> they they physically wouldn't fit in the little pockets on the side of my backpack, so I carried them in my pockets. Oh my god! Made it easy to get to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It becomes part of you as opposed to part of the backpack. Quite right too. <laughs> How did you resupply on the trail? Did you just go into towns, or did you mail yourself stuff, or get somebody mail you just to get somebody to mail you stuff? Well, the first the first part of the trail, I did it the traditional way. I had a few mail drops at Neil Gap and at the Fontana Dam, and uh, my mom would send those. She was my support person. And um, funny story, further down the trail, I got pretty broke. I was trying to do it for a, a dollar a mile, and that's impossible, basically. Yes. So, uh, yes. you know, I basically uh, didn't have a lot of money to go to grocery stores and stuff. But people yeah. watching my YouTube videos wanted were rooting for me and they wanted to see me keep going and they started sending mail drops wow isn't that isn't that amazing don't you think that's extraordinary and for for somebody who's a self-confessed loner the fact that people reached out to you i think you know it's just another fantastic example of how kind people are and how people want to share in your triumph really don't they they want to share in your journey you were the catalyst for their adventure almost weren't you and they were they were they became a part of the hike and the yeah and it did. It felt great that they were that interested and that they had determined to see me keep going. And uh, yeah. at first, I didn't know how to handle it. And I told several people, no thanks. I can do it on my own. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then, you know, it became a necessity, basically. And, uh, yeah. boy, if it wasn't for that, I don't. I wouldn't be here talking to you now. Now, like me, 
and we talk about the hike now, you were bitten by a dog on the trail. And yeah. I haven't read precisely how that happened, but I was bitten by a dog as well. Whose dog was it for a start? Well, it was um, some southbounders, some sobos, mm-hmm. and this was in the 100-mile wilderness. All right. And um, I, they were kind of sketchy. They might have been hobos, actually. They, they were kind of sketchy, these two guys, and they both had a dog. And um, this one was a white dog. It maybe was half German Shepherd, maybe half, I don't know, I don't know what, pit or something. Yeah. And the guy told me, he said, look, my dog's kind of skittish, so just be careful. But the guy, the dog was walking around. It wasn't on the leash or anything, and he let me pet it. So I was fine. I thought we were fine. Well, the next morning, I walked back to the campfire where they were at, and um, just to say bye or whatever. And the dog walked to me just like he had the night before. Like, I, And I started to reach out to pet him, and he just lunged at me and grabbed onto my leg. Wow. And the guy hollered, and I hollered. So he grabs his dog, and then he puts – the leash on him. And then he puts the muzzle on him. Well, if you know your dog needs a muzzle, <laughs> there's a bit of a clue. The fact, be, you, yeah, there's a bit of a clue. The fact that he's carrying a muzzle, isn't there? Really, See. he probably shouldn't be walking around. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he shouldn't be walking around free, and he definitely shouldn't be on the Appalachian Trail. Yeah, and uh, but luckily the dog had lunged, and he, when he bit me, he bit me on my water bottle in my pocket, just like we were talking about. All right, so. That saved me from getting injured, too. <laughs> Quite right, too. Quite right. How did your, your dog bike go? Well, I, I was walking up out of Perisburg, and I just raised – I saw a hiker there, and he was sort of dozing, and his dog was, I think, dozing by his feet. And I just put my – put my I think I must have put my arms up. I said, hi, you know, you know, raising your poles and sort of saying hi. I said, hi, right. and the dog just went straight for my leg. And um, I, I got cellulitis as a result, a bacterial infection of the skin, so I had to come home for oh. 10 days. Yeah, it wasn't good at all, but, you know – it's one of those things, I guess. Um, I've, I've had a couple of people who've taken dogs on the trail, and the ones I've spoken to seem to understand the need to keep them under control. But if, if you don't, you don't. You know, it's one of those things. And now, one of the things you actually referred to it early on, and I think it's one of the things I found so strange about your camping arrangements, particularly as you say, you know, you got friendly with people. You hardly ever, or if, if not just rarely, stayed at shelters. But you were camping more like about a mile after the shelters. Did this continue throughout the hike, and why did you do that? Oh, yeah, I did it the whole time. Um, it wasn't to be antisocial or because I don't like people. It wasn't because of that. Um, I just physically cannot sleep in a room, let alone a shelter, with five or six, seven, ten other people. It's just I don't see how anyone does it. Um, <laughs> regular people feel the same way about me. They don't see how I want to sleep out by myself, you know? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, if I slept in a shelter with – I never have done it. If I did, I wouldn't. I wouldn't get a wink. Um, right. I and it's also for their benefit as well because I'm a bad snore. Yeah. So. Oh, and oh. I mean, I meant to that. I meant to that. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> so I, I would be self conscious about that. I would be worried. I was keeping them awake. And also, a lot of times at shelters, people don't hang their food bags right, or they burn trash, or yeah, they yeah, want right. to stay up all night, or they want to go to bed early. And if I hang um, hang out by myself, I can just kind of do whatever I want. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 at that part, I kind of understand, yeah. But for me, being with other people, cat, and, and I never hardly ever slept in shelters. It was always in my tent because I, mm-hmm. I was uncomfortable about uh, snoring and so on. But, but if I'm in my tent, frankly, I can snore as much as I like. You know, I stayed away from the shelters. But I love shelter life, hanging around for, lu- for lunch and dinner and stuff like that. I really enjoyed that part of it. I would go there for lunch, and I would hang out with everybody and just say hi to everybody. And, uh... All right. So, But when you had this kind of um, – and I, and I suppose I call it self-imposed uh, exile from the other hikers. Did you use that time for much self-reflection, or is that what you do? You enjoy that part of it, the, the the you know being slightly shy and being slightly lonely. Did you find you could really think about life? Well, you know how the trail is. Whether you're by yourself or with other people, you have hours upon hours, miles, you know, miles to th- think to yourself. So yeah, there was plenty of time to think about things and. Uh, I would spend a lot of time daydreaming and, um, you know, watching the trees go by and thinking about the next stop. And uh, yeah. it wasn't until after that it really hit me that, you know, after I'd completed the trail, that this was a big deal and it was something really important. And But during you, the hike... Weren't um, you aware of it at the time? Of course. I knew it was a big deal. And I knew if I didn't do it now, I would never, you know, it'd be hard yeah. to come back and do it again. Yeah. But as far as working on inner stuff, you know... Um, not so much. I, I think my my hiking that way was like it most other people. Yeah, I, I certainly found that 
I, I'd gone onto this trail, I remember the first 30, 40, 50, maybe 100 miles thinking, oh my God, I'm going to have so much time to think about stuff. And yet, you know, the, 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 the miles go by, then the states go by. And I remember turning up in Maine thinking, oh my God, I've still got so many other things to think about <laughs> as, if I, <laughs> as if I'd run out of time on the trail. Did, did you, when you were doing this, did you discover anything new about yourself on the trail? No, I pretty much just confirmed everything that I, uh, you know, I just work, I just work better hanging out by myself, and there was you know plenty of time to think about stuff. And um, the tra- the trail is a is a great leveler for people. I think it, you all have to do that same thing. You have to um, pack your tent up, and you have to eat, and you have to hike. And there are very limited things to do, aren't they? But you ha- we all have to do the, those same things. And I think that's that's a really important part of this journey, uh, realizing that the things that are important in your day each each and every day and it's virtually the same thing it's virtually the same thing isn't it yeah and you learn you learn not to take things for granted you learn to to conserve your water conserve your food um again with the lightweight backpack i really had to watch what i ate and uh you know i couldn't pack yeah 10 days of food or six days of food i usually carried four days worth of food and uh, if i didn't make it to the next stop in time i might run out or i did run out a few times how are you squaring that with trying to do a dollar a mile? You know, because you're right, two thousand odd dollars for this trip is is nowhere near enough, is it? No, and I'm you know I am thrifty, and I I'm you know I didn't plan to do the hotels at all. I I thought I would never go into a hotel on the trip. All right. I figured out the only way to get my videos on was to because the whole the computers at the hostels obviously don't you know usually no. don't work. No. The libraries wouldn't work, so I actually bought a small laptop during my trip. Wow. And uh, the cheap, cheapest one I could find, and I would bounce it ahead two, three hundred miles to the next town where I would stay at a hotel. So that ate up a lot of the budget. Oh wow! That was the only way. Yeah, but that was the only way to get the videos on, and that was kind of. I don't know if I would have wanted to do the trip without the videos to have it. To uh, was the recording of the videos was that for you or was that for other people? Did you want a record of your hike, or did you want your hike to be out there to other people? Both. Um, I've always been a big YouTuber. I've made probably a hundred skateboard videos. Oh, right. And yeah. And, uh, so I knew videos was something I wanted to do to document the hike for other people and for myself. You obviously, you obviously met a lot of other people on the trail anyway. And you said you, you got them, you tend to get on, get on fine with them. And I know that you met a woman on the trail and you became very close. Tell us about how that relationship developed because I saw a number of times people would hook up on the trail and I, I couldn't think of anything worse myself, but, uh, you know, cause we're all basically li- living in a pretty stinky environment. And, uh, but I know that <laughs> happened a few times, but I know you met a, a lady on the, on the, on the trail, didn't you? Yeah. Well, this is another story that you're not going to hear anywhere else. It was funny. She wasn't actually hiking the trail. Oh, really? <laughs> I, yeah. Again, I was a YouTuber and I made, I'm also a, a big artifact collector of Indian native American Indian artifacts. And I'd post videos and there was a, it's not a subculture, you know, and you post videos of what you found or, and ask people what they think or how old it is. And, um, this girl was another, another part of that subculture of hunting artifacts. And, um, we, we barely knew each other. We maybe we write on each other's videos every once in a while. Mm-hmm. And during my hike on my through hike, um, I wrote on one of her videos, just made a comment and I did it with the loner, um, YouTube handle and she caught on and she started watching the videos and writing comments, and then we started emailing back and forth, and then one day she asked me to call her. So a couple weeks later, I called her, and a couple weeks later after that, um, I invited her to come hike, and she did. She came out to Maine, and she flew out a 1,000 miles. Wow. And um, we hiked 40 miles together. (laughs) You got a fan to come and hike you. Hike you, that's quite something, isn't it? Yeah, it was, you know, it's incredible, but um, that's what happened, and we did 40 miles together. We had a great time, and. Uh, what better way to get to know know someone than, uh, you know, do 40 miles with them? <laughs> yes. No, well, I, I can think of a lot better ways, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure you, I'm sure you got to know them though. No doubt about that. And, well, and you, you know, and you continued that relationship after the trail, didn't you? Yeah. As soon as I, you know, not as soon as I got done, I went to visit my grandma when I got done. She lived in Maine. And then I took the bus, um, to Ohio where she was living and, um, lived with her there for three or four weeks and um she moved i asked her to move to south carolina with me and she did and uh, we loaded up her van and cool she jumped right in the rv with me and started traveling around the flea markets and you know it worked out great for a long time we had a great time and i don't regret any of it it, it, it lasted about two years right which is my world record 
So. <laughs> <laughs> but you realise, by the way, that's not a world record. That may be more a Jeffrey record, and not that, a world record. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. <laughs> for me, that's pretty good. And um, you know, we're still halfway buddies. Once that was over, you returned once more to to a solitary life and having. Have, when you meet people on the trail and you get used to them and you get and those friendships develop quite quickly, don't they? They they become quite mm. in, quite intense quite quickly. Those friendships on the trail, I think. Did you find it difficult going back to your previous life, or were you quite okay to slip right back into it again? Well, I didn't have a lot of time to worry about it. I kind of had to get back to work selling at the flea market, and making some money because I was flat broke and yeah. I had her. You know, I had her with me now too, and she wasn't working, so we, you know, we both kind of did it together and. Uh, it wasn't really hard getting back to life because I had to, I had to get back and get started. But, <laughs> that's, um, yeah, that that sorts it out, doesn't it? Yeah, when, you, when you've got bills to pay, it certainly does. Yeah. Have you hiked again? I, we, me and her did a few hikes, and then I did. I went back to Maine. I did another fifty miles in 2016 and 2015, excuse me, um, to meet some friends that I had made on on YouTube again. They invited me to come out and hike, and I was a uh, going to Maine anyway to visit my grandma again. So I went and uh, hung out with them for a while. And, and uh, so I did, I did another, I did the Bigelow's again, and uh, which I picked the hardest section to do. Oh, the Bigelow's beautiful. Absolutely. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. beautiful. And the first, the first time I kind of had to rush through it, you know, to get done. So the second time when I went back, I got to really take my time and enjoy it. Plus I was uh, going a lot slower because I yes. wasn't, I didn't have trail legs or anything. How long did you? How long did you take to do the trial? I've got to ask you that in the first um, in two thousand twelve. Yeah, five and a half months. All right, not bad. Not bad at all, was it really? I just, That's about average. I think. With a fifteen pound pack, <laughs> it does make it a lot easier. I must say, God dear me. So you had your YouTube channel, and you you still, I presume, have a YouTube channel because obviously you've got oh, some, yeah. some stuff on there as well. Did you enjoy mm-hmm. that that connection with people through their comments, or is that once again your your filter for people the you is your youtube channel channel rather sort of the filter that you have for people i think it makes me closer to people because well i put those vid- the first batch of videos on and i couldn't wait to get to the next town and see if anyone would, was even watching you know i didn't announce my hike i didn't uh do anything like that um and when i got to the next town and i i checked the library and there was 40 comments you know from people i didn't even know and yeah. boy that was exciting that other people were that interested in uh I saw one of your videos and I, I was while I was watching it, I can't remember which one it was, and I looked down below, there had already been seventeen thousand views. So, you know, a lot of people do watch these things, don't they? Oh yeah. And it's become really popular to do this. Yeah. Um back then there wasn't very many and people, some people call me the grandfather of uh YouTube video blogging for AT video. I, I must say, when I realized the date was 2012, yours were quite sophisticated, weren't they? I mean, c- compared to even now, some of them now. I mean, I, when I look at my pathetic <laughs> video attempts on the trail in 2014, I, I can see that had I spent a little more time over it, they could have been better. But yeah, you, yours are quite sophisticated, I thought. I was probably the first one who made an effort to do some editing. Most people, they just point the camera at themselves while they're walking and telling you what has happened. They're giving yeah. you updates of what happened in town, what town they went to. But I would show them the town. I would show them where I went and show them the, the restaurants. And that's kind of what the book kind of went right into that, too. Yeah. Um, I, be- I became, I didn't expect this, but whenever I went to a town, the history of the town would just intrigue me so much. I spent a lot of time, you know, in the museums, yeah. um, stuff like this. And um, so I'd put that in the videos, too. So a lot of other videos didn't have that, especially at that time. There's some lovely history, the Civil War history through, is it Gatland or something like that? Gatland. Um, I went through a little museum that was just on the trail, and I, and I love mm-hmm. that. As well. I love that as well. And I noticed that uh, I was watching your – always always go for the summit videos. I saw your summit video, and when you got to the, the uh, sign, uh, you sat down in front of the sign. You thanked everybody, which I thought was very touching. And you've mentioned her twice already, your grandmother in Maine as well, didn't you? Yeah, that's my Bobsy. Your pop, your pops, your pops, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's I, wonder whether you, I, I wonder whether you'd say that. Yeah, <laughs> your pops, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, well, I didn't even know she was watching. I didn't, I didn't, hadn't told her I was doing this, or maybe I'd mentioned it, but I didn't know she was watching my YouTube videos. And, um, like I said, I was so broke most of the hike. Yeah. About halfway through, I was going to sell my computer and just get a, a bus ticket home because I just didn't have any money. Yeah. If I had enough food, I would go to the next town. Yeah, you know, yeah. if someone sent me a, a Dropbox and there was twenty bucks in it. I'd go to the next town and I'd keep hiking. 
but she found out I was having a hard time and she sent some money to help me, some money to help me finish the trail. So if it wasn't for her again, I wouldn't be here. And your mother was a great supporter as well. I know your mother saw you off and so on. But, you know, you, all these people who believe they've done the, the, done the hype by themselves, they really haven't. We all know we needed other uh-huh. people around us to help us. And I love that part of it. I think it's a, it's a great testimony to people, the, the humanity of people. And I think we get out there, even though we're by ourselves, we're really not ever by ourselves because there are always people who want to help us and, and, and try and help us. So whenever, if anybody's ever thinking of doing this trail, you're never going to be by yourself unless you choose to be, but you'll always have people who support you. And I, I love that part of it. I really do. The support from home is just as important as, as what you've, uh, all your planning and all your gear. you got to have support. 100% agree, 100% agree. Now, you hiked it in 2012, but your book, Painted Blazes, was published uh, just this year. It looks like it was anyway, so, because you, you kindly right. sent me a copy. Is there a reason you left it for five years, or were you writing it continuously in, in that time? Because, And the reason I can understand why it would take quite a long time is you pack it with some real detail, don't you? Oh, yeah, I did a lot of research. I found out that when I was writing the book, I just wanted to learn as much as I could. And... um put that right in the book so it's there for other people to read but yeah, yeah i did the tyke in 2012 and i didn't have any idea i was going to write a book i'm not a gifted writer or a natural writer um i thought the youtube videos would be my my heirloom to the trail you know yeah. for me to look back on and then people would start well a lot of, the whole way through people to this day still email me with questions where's a good town to stop at around here where's yeah yeah what's a good section to do and i would write these really long answers and then I would start putting those answers in the video description. Then the yeah. video descriptions were too short. So I opened up a word program and started typing. <laughs> and, uh, but that was, 2000, you know, that was, that was a 2013 or so. And I had the idea to start writing the book. And then my mother got sick. She got um, stage four ovarian, ovarian cancer. Oh, dear. So that's a year of that. And she, she made it through that. Good. And then we had a good year where I got a lot of the book done. And um, she was helping me with it, and then it had spread to her brain. Oh, gee. And uh, she passed away uh, last year, so she got to read some of the book, and um, she really enjoyed some of the stories. And uh, she was my support person. And- yeah, I could tell. I could tell she was. I, I didn't. Uh, uh, I hadn't. Wasn't aware she passed, but I, I certainly was aware how important because she does the forward to the book, doesn't she as well? Yeah, that was. I I took the introduction um, from her blog that she had wrote the whole time that I was hiking. That's uh-huh. how she dealt with it. That's how, because she worried about me the whole way. Of course, mothers are warriors. And <laughs> so she wrote a blog the whole time yeah. for other mothers to follow and yeah. to, to support each other, which I also yeah. thought was interesting. Yes, it is. That's where the, uh, the forward of the book comes from. All right. Yeah. That, that was actually, I, I can tell people, I, and I haven't read it all yet because I'm, because it's quite a, quite a, a substantial book to get through, but I tell you what I think is great for, Good for dipping in every now and then because there's always a little snippet on the, on on a page, there's like a tip and things like that. And it's really worth looking at just dipping into it from time to time. I mean, read the whole thing as well, but really, there's so much information in there. I think it's a, a really really nice uh, nice read from what I've read so far. Anyway, well, thank you. Appreciate that very much. Are you gonna re- are you gonna do any more writing, or is that it? Is that your legacy for the trade? That and your videos, uh, or are you gonna carry on doing more stuff on the on the YouTube channel? Well, the YouTube channel is going wide open. I'm doing, um, I'm posting a video every week of footage that I didn't include in the original series. I had tons of video footage and tons of pictures that I didn't show yeah, that same, I'm yeah. putting on there now. And um, the book, I know it's still a big book, but I also I cut out about seventy thousand words just to get it down <laughs> to this size. So I've got enough, almost enough for another book. So well, I'm going to probably do some more research and uh, do a more painted blazes soon. Oh, go for it! Really, go for it. Well, I, I'm I'm so glad. I'm so glad one of our, one of our listeners uh, suggested I, I speak with you, and I'm really glad that I did. And I really appreciate you se- uh, sending me the book, and and I really appreciate you taking time out to to talk to us because yours is a really interesting story, and and I think you, you're a good example of somebody who may have thought may think they may not have been able to do the trail beforehand, but you know you did it. You went out there. You did it on quite low funds. You did it you carried carried a light weight and you you made your way through the trail everybody does it differently and yours is another story of somebody doing it differently as well and, and i applaud you for that cool well look thanks very much for talking i, I really appreciate the i say you taking the time out to uh, talk with us hey thank you too steve for supporting hikers and 
doing these uh, podcasts because it's really interesting. And uh, I want to thank Bruce uh, RTK for uh, recommending me to your to your blog. Uh, I'm sure he'll he'll appreciate that as well. Good to talk to you, and hopefully we'll we'll talk again. Let me know when you do your second book. Let me know when you do your second book. I will. Thank you. Okay, buddy. Cheers then. Cheers. I recorded that a couple of weeks ago, and to be honest with you, I'd forgotten how touched I was by Jeffrey's story at the time. I think I was recording a lot of stuff around that time, so I may have compartmentalised it and moved on. It was only when I was editing that I took in some of the things he was saying, especially about how and why he uses YouTube. He also reminded me of the various subcultures that exist within our country, indeed any country, and the trail seems to provide the perfect home for these subcultures, or at least some of the people within them. I also loved how he confirmed, as people often do, that the trail always provides. It was pretty much at the end, totally out of money, yet something turned up. I thought that he was very inspirational for those of you who may doubt your capacity to take on the AT. And, of course, I was totally empathetic when he said he'd been bitten by a dog. Us dog bite victims need to stand together. As I think I mentioned before, there'll be links in the show notes to Lona's YouTube channel and his book. Now, as I mentioned last week, we're on the verge of starting a second podcast where we're going to do a really deep dive into the motivations, preparation and execution of a through hike. I always intended to cover somebody's 2018-80 journey in detail, and I believe that I've found an excellent person to follow. As I mentioned last week, Bruce Matson introduced himself to both me and the show back in one of our earlier episodes when he left a review on iTunes. We ended up getting a couple of beers together, and I learned of his deep, really deep desire to do a through-hike of the trail. Well, we kept in touch and started to talk about his plans and the possibility of making him this year's Chesser. Minus the cute shorts, of course, and he agreed. Now, I know that there are plenty of people I could have followed, but Bruce has added an extra dimension to his hike that I really want him to share with you before the show goes out. So, earlier this week, we got on the phone together. Now, I'd now like to give you a little teaser about our new show, Returning to Katahdin, an Appalachian Trail Dream. Here's Bruce. Okay, we're on here with uh, Bruce Matson, and Bruce and I are doing a new show together um, starting on November the 6th. So look out for that on Monday, November the 6th. Firstly, hi, Bruce. How are you? Great, Steve. Thanks for having me. Great. Lovely to speak to you. Um, and we're going to be doing a real deep dive into every aspect of hiking the AT in the new show. So we're not going to cover any of that today at all. What we're going to do we're going we're gonna to save that for the show itself. But I think that what I'd really like you to talk about, and um, this is one of the reasons I really think this is a, a really great, uh, going to be a great podcast for people, is what you're going to be doing this year in conjunction with your hike and how you're hoping to give back to the hiking community as a result. Uh, sure, Steve. Well, thanks. Um, well, I've had this dream of doing this hike for a good number of years. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We'll get into that later too, I think. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when I thought about it, um, initially I, I was just thinking about doing the hike uh, for myself and just mostly trying to figure out how to get myself from Georgia to Maine. <laughs> but, you know, inevitably, you know, at this stage of life, uh, you have to admit from time to time you look back on uh, what you've done, what you've done well, what you haven't done so well. Sure. And you really, at least, you know, I really realized that uh, whatever I've done in life, whatever I've really been able to accomplish, it wasn't really me without a lot of help from a lot of other people. Um, and I'm not that kind of guy. I, you know, I grew up in Connecticut. I'm uh, kind of one of these uh, Yankee uh, independents. I really believe in uh, pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. And cool. uh, But, uh, you know, after living a few years and looking back, you realize that an awful lot of people – I've done an awful lot of things to help me get to whatever I've, where I've gotten to and whatever I've been able to accomplish. And uh, with that sort of perspective, thinking about this hike, I really said, you know, a lot of people do hikes for different charities. You yourself, I know, uh, help to raise money for uh, Family Partnership Center. Yeah, Family Partnership Center. Yeah, yeah and a number of people have um, – and uh you know walk for sunshine and uh, you know yes. ones you hear about ones you don't hear about and yeah. 
it got me thinking that, you know, this is a pretty big undertaking and, you know, could I accomplish something else with it at the same time? And with this sort of notion of giving back, you know, being grateful for what's been given to me, yeah. you know, what, what should I do? What could I do? And decided that, you know, it is a pretty big deal. And, uh, you know, maybe I could do something and use the hike as an event to giving back. I've run a couple of marathons in my life and people use those races sometimes to raise money. So I gave it some thought and, um, I sit on the, actually sit on the board of a couple of not-for-profits and thought about raising money for them. But I kept coming back to this idea that I've been studying the trail a lot. As we'll talk probably later, a real lot. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you're very, thor- know, you're very thorough, uh, Bruce. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, well, but, um, you know, the trail's in, always in danger. The trail needs help. You know, the ATC is out there, you know, running, protecting sure. the trail. But uh, the more I've dived into it and met people and talked to people, it, it, the trail really has, uh, you know, transformative impact on people. Yeah, and uh, I, it, it may sound a little silly, but... You, you talk about, well, you can give a man a fish or you can teach him to fish. Yeah. And in some ways I think about, you know, if you raise money for the trail, if you can help the trail out, then there'll be more people doing the trail, doing their own hikes for their own charities and the like. So yeah. that's kind of a long way of saying that uh, I gave a lot of thought to different things I'd like to do and settled on, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try to raise money for the trail itself. So um, part of my hike will be focused very much on trying to raise money for the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, which wow. I think you know most of your all your listeners know yeah. uh, is the entity most responsible for preserving and protecting uh, that sliver of a national park that runs down the east coast. <laughs> How have they reacted, Bruce? How they, cause I know you've spoken to them about it. How, how are they? Are they on board with this? Yeah, it's it's been rather remarkable. Uh, they're very much on board. Uh, they're helping me out quite a bit. I'm going to post on my website there. They did a press release recently featuring me. They're actually going to do a, a piece in the next uh, magazine that comes out uh, for the ATC. Uh, I think it's uh, called AT Journeys. They've been very supportive. Uh, they have you know, provided personnel to help with marketing and helping with uh, some of the uh, technical aspects of uh, raising money by helping me create mechanism to have people come to my site, which will drive them really to the ATC site so that I don't have to uh, do very much. I know you've got quite a target in mind, haven't you? Is there anything you can share with us on that or not? Sure, sure. Um yeah, you know, I thought, you know, could we do something big, could do something great? And I started trying to figure out what, what is it that might be significant. So I actually met with Ron Tipton, who is the executive director of the ATC, who I know you interviewed yeah. not too long ago. And uh, I said, what would be a record? I said, Ron, is what, what number would, you know, I didn't know <laughs> how big that number might be yeah, and whether be it would dangerous. work. But Careful I said, what you wish for, yeah. But, um <laughs> Basically, I learned that if I could raise two hundred fifty thousand dollars, that would be considered the biggest individual gift, Man. other than a few gifts that were done uh, bequests upon death. Uh, that would be, uh, you know, the biggest gift. So um, certainly significant. I know, as they've got a budget. So that's what we're they, trying to do. Exactly, it's to make a difference. That is a real difference as well. So, are you are you confident you can be able to get there? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, there are days when I am very confident. I think uh, you know we're going to do twice as much. There's a company that's helping me with ideas, and they're like, "Oh, Bruce, there's no reason we can't do a million dollars." And uh, sometimes oh, I get very excited <gasps> and uh, get energized, and uh, other times I think, you know, what have I gotten myself into? But uh, <laughs> you know, I'm a fairly determined guy, um, and uh, I'd like to think. I didn't go into this without some thought. And so, um, yeah, I um, I feel like we're going to do this. Whether we do more than the goal, I don't know. That would be just uh, 
tremendous to be able to do that. And, you know, as we go sort of, as we go along the trail, then uh, we'll see how it goes and see if we get lucky. You know, maybe yeah. there's a person or two out there who, you know, has the same passion for the trail that I have and that they would come along with a significant gift or so. So, um, yeah. That's, so that's great. That is absolutely uh, fantastic. Little, uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit. It's a real big number, and now I'm really excited to be doing this podcast because I and I wanted you. I wanted people to know straight away that this is all about you trying to give back to the trail. This is something you wanted to do for years and years and years, and we're going to do a real deep dive into your preparation for the trail. We're going to follow you like we follow Jessa, and uh, <laughs> and and hopefully you're gonna you're not going to entertain some of the doubts Jessa Jessa entertained on the trail. And it's going to be an exciting journey as we follow you all the way from beginning to the end. So, how can people actually get more information before we start the podcast? Sure. Um- so I have a, a website that has uh, been mildly active, and we've been kind of waiting for this sort of to launch in a sense. Sure. Um, did have a, I actually had a little technical difficulties with uh, my site that caused me to lose a week or two, <laughs> but it's actually solved those things as recently as Friday. So oh, um, there is a website, and it's uh, called returningtokatahdin.com. And uh, it uh, should be readily available uh, on the internet. And there are some initial posts about uh, me and the journey and some other things I've done. And there'll be um, fairly active uh, blog posts beginning over the next week or so. And then it'll be pretty regular two or three times uh, a week That's as awesome. we prepare for and depart uh, from Springer. And we're going to catch up regularly. Um, and we're going to make sure that this is going to be a real dive into what it takes to do this thing from beginning to end. So I, I for one, can't wait to get this started, Bruce. And uh, appreciate you coming on to give everybody a little bit of a teaser about what you're doing. And uh, we look forward to that first episode, which will be out at 3 a.m. on the Monday morning of the 6th of November. So uh, for now, it's goodbye, and uh, we'll catch up with you soon. Thanks so much, Steve. Look forward to it. Okay, buddy. Take it easy. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> about that, a quarter of a million bucks to help look after the trail for you and me and the thousands of others who will be coming after us. Bruce has such a passion for the trail, and it really is infectious when you speak with him. I asked him for a resume, you know, just to get an idea of what he's done over his life. Man, it was impressive. And I'll be filling in some of his background as the weeks progress. I hope you're going to enjoy hearing from Bruce as much as you did listening to Jessa last year. She's going to be a hard act to follow, but I'm really hopeful that Bruce is the guy to do it. So, Monday, November the 6th, you'll be able to get episode number one on iTunes and all the other places that you find your podcasts. Now, we've got DocSpot. Before we get on to this week's segment, I meant to tell you last week something that Lynn reminded me of off microphone this week. The first aid kit that she suggested in last week's show isn't generally available as a package that you'd normally get in an Outfitters. She said that you can get all that stuff from a regular store or your pharmacy at a fraction of the cost of some of these kits. So be selective and save yourself some money. So here's Lynn and advice on how to deal with the various wounds that you can get. As somebody who spent at least half of my time on the trail bleeding from some orifice or other, I intend to pay close attention. Okay, we're back with Lynn. Hi, Lynn. How are you? I'm good, thanks. That's good. And this week, you're going to tell us all about how to treat and look after wounds. Yeah, so, you know, clearly uh, you're going to be in that type of an environment. You're always potentially injuring yourself and you're going to get some sort of wounds. But again, you want to make sure that the wounds don't affect you so that you can continue on your hike and you don't have to get off trail. Um, So what I'm going to tell you is how to manage the wounds and also what to look for in the event that, you know what, okay, now it's time to go seek medical attention. (laughs) <laughs> right. <laughs> Some of the research that I did was actually from the Wilderness Medical Society practice guidelines for basic wound management in the austere environment. Oh I loved God. that. <laughs> 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 That's what they call the backcountry. Oh, yes. um, important to know this, that there's actually three types of wounds, clean, dirty, and contaminated. Uh-huh. Now, people might think, well, aren't they all the same? You know, a clean wound is a basic wound that, like a cut or something, and that's also on an area of the skin that's not a fold or what what I call the nooks and crannies, 
because if you have it on a fold or an area under, like in, under the arm or a groin, those are an area of higher bacterial count as opposed right. to, for instance, on the forearm or the face. So you're more worried about getting infected there. A contaminated wound is actually a wound that has soil in it or uh, fecal material. Um, that can ser- get seriously, ha- has a very serious high bacterial content. Yeah. And how does the wound happen? Was it an animal or a human bite? If it's an animal or a human bite, that's it. You need to get off the trail and you need to get medical attention because these do require at least antibiotics or in some cases you have to have rabies prevention or rabies prophylaxis if it's an animal bite. I was, um, I, was, I was bitten by a dog on the trail and I got cellulitis. Uh, so that was a pretty serious thing. And I actually came home for about seven or eight days as well on a, on a very high, heavy course of antibiotics. But it cured me, so I was okay. Yes. Um, and uh, so, uh, so it can definitely be cured. But um, hopefully if people get bitten by some sort of an animal, even if we're not talking about rabies, an animal or a human, it can happen that they get the attention or the medical attention they need very quickly so that they don't have to wind up going home, that they can get the antibiotics, get the treatment they need, maybe a tetanus shot if necessary, and be able to continue on their way. Is it true to say then that treatment of virtually anything, the sooner you get it, the better, because that will stop an escalation of the pro- progress of the whatever the illness or disease could be? It, again, it depends. I'm talking here just specifically about bite wounds. Those oh. need medical attention. Oh. If you have a wound, if you cut yourself with a knife or you have a bad blister or even a superficial burn like from your jet boil or from the campfire or something like yeah. that, yeah. and you treat it by, you know, on your own in the, on the trail and you, you have the, uh, you're able to clean it and you're able to use a little bit of disinfectant uh, maybe cover it with a Band-Aid, and you monitor the wound for the next 24 hours. And if you see that it's stable and it's it's not worsening, the red area is not getting worse, or you're not yeah. developing fevers, anything like that, you don't necessarily need to seek medical attention. Um, okay. You do need to seek attention if it's a bite wound. That's really yeah. important. Right, yeah. okay. Let's start with the, 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 so the clean wound is the wound where it is not in a fold area, how do you treat a clean wound then? So the best thing to do is to clean it with, um, if you have it, some clean uh, drinking water, potable water and some soap, and then put some sort of a covering on it. If it's actively bleeding, make sure you put some pressure on it uh, to try to stop the bleeding. The, the clot that will form is not only will stop the bleeding, but it's also, it's, is nature's own little band-aid. It's going to prevent bacteria from getting under the skin, into the skin and into the body. So again, a little bit of soap and water, if you don't have that, some Purell is fine, a little bit of triple antibiotic ointment and a, a bandage or something. Is that, to cover is it. that like Neosporin or something like that? Yes, Neosporin, yeah. Bacitracin, they have store brands that are less expensive and equally as effective. Okay. And then, again, you monitor it, and you, you try to clean it at least twice a day, in the morning before you get on the trail and in the evening when you're making camp and you're getting ready to, to eat or, or go to bed, clean it again. So you actually clean a wound, even though it's a rel- you think it's relatively clean. So every day you still treat it again, effectively? Yes. Um, you don't want to scrub, scrub, scrub. You want to just gently, you know, a little bit of soap and water, again, as you're doing your morning uh, routine or something, because that's removing the old bacitracin that could, you know, be a little bit goopy. Um, okay. You clean it again, you put a little bit of bacitracin, you put a clean bandage on. That's going to prevent, that's going to be your best way of preventing an infection from getting worse and having right. you to uh, derail your trip. Okay. And so what about a dirty wound? A dirty wound is, again, an area uh, that's got a higher bacterial count either under the arm, uh, in the groin area, folds of the skin. Because it's not open to the air, it's more likely to have a higher bacterial count, so it's more likely to become infected. 
Right. All the more reason to really clean it well, to dry it well, to put some sort of a protective dressing and, and look at it every day so you knowing that it's, it's starting to heal and it's not progressing. The contaminated wound does need irrigation. Um, you want to get that, that soil that has that high bacteria account out of that yeah. wound. That's really important. And if you, uh, it's recommended to use at least a liter of water and some sort of pressure to really irrigate that that wound. Wow! Wow! Yeah, I mean, you think I've had you plenty think of times it's a lot, got, and it is a lot. But if yeah. but think about it, do you want some animal poop in your wound? <laughs> <laughs> but, I'm being very blunt about this. Frankly, but think no. Think about that. <laughs> Then you want to clean that out because then then you're you're going to be okay. You're going to be able to continue on your trip. Um, so that's really important to irrigate a contaminated wound. And once that's out, that then gets treated, I presume, like a regular, uh, just a dirty cut or or even a regular wound. Because once you've cleaned it out as best best of your ability, and it's not always that easy to do, is it either? So you've got this water. You just basically slush it out. I mean, I, I'm really. Not, I'm not really getting how you, might, how you get it out because I know I had several times I fell over badly and I got some bad, bad cuts and muddy cuts in my elbow. I remember particularly in my elbow. And and I swooshed as much of it out as I could and I wiped out as much as I could. It still left a little bit inside there and it's tough to do, tough to get to. Isn't it, it is really? very tough to do. And again, these are guidelines. Um, these are guidelines from the Wilderness Medical Society. You do what you can, Okay. Yeah. Uh, the best thing to do is to try to clean it out as much as possible. Again, do what you can. Don't just leave it. Right. And it may work. It may not. And again, that's the whole idea behind observation. Observe, observe the wound over the course of the next 24, 48 hours. And if it's getting better, hey, you did all right. Yeah. If it's getting worse, then that's when you need to, to, uh, to hike out. And that is a time to go to an urgent care center or something like that. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, that's useful information. And I must say, a liter of water seems a huge amount, but uh, I understand what you're trying to achieve. But yeah, that's a lot of water to slush on. I never did it, that. It's a lot of water, you. especially if you're thinking, okay, am I gonna, am I gonna be able to now not drink a liter of water? <laughs> um, so you know, you really have to weigh you know, weigh your chances here. But that's, again, that's what the, the, the Wilderness Medical Society practice guidelines recommend. That's super. That's lovely. That's very helpful. Thanks very much indeed, Lynn. And we'll catch up with you again next week. All right. That sounds terrific. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> a litre of water. Oh, my God. Oh, I didn't get a dangerous infection on the trail. I will never know. By the way, I hope nobody's being put off by all this stuff that can go wrong with your hike. From my experience, while I bled at somewhat regular intervals, I didn't die nor even suffer that much. I got over my dog bite and I got back on the trail. Every time I fell, I'd call out the number of the fall and get straight back up. These little segments are just meant to prepare you for stuff that may or may not happen to you. Better safe than sorry. Next week's guest is a young hiker who has recently completed the trail. Silas Schroeder's dad emailed me about his son, of whom he was massively proud, of course. I did my online stalking bit and decided that Silas would make an excellent guest, and so it proved. I think you're going to enjoy hearing from Silas. Chapter 27 is the second from last chapter in my book, and I'm looking forward to starting Earl Schaefer's book in a couple of weeks. I'm kind of sad that my story is coming to an end. Believe it or not, I've really loved recording this and reliving my journey with you. I hope that the feeling is mutual. As a bit of an add-on to these last miles, I've included a link in the show notes of a new version of my own video of New Hampshire and Maine. I put this on my Facebook pages last week, so apologies if you've already seen it, but I think that it's pretty darn inspiring, even if I do say so myself. We're on to the last miles by now, with less than 60 to go. We are so excited, with thoughts of completion and home as we approach the end. There's an extraordinary view of Katahdin from the side of one of those amazing lakes. In fact, the picture that T-Bird took of me at that lake is the one used for this podcast. We see another couple of moose and emerge from the 100-mile wilderness to witness the full glory of Katahdin from Abel Bridge. I defy anybody who's ever been on that bridge to remain unmoved by the sight. Bloody marvellous. See you all next week.
Chapter 27. Last Miles We were now on the final few days. A glance at the guide showed that these last 55 miles were fairly flat, apart, of course, for the devastating steepness that indicated our goal. We had tried to spot Katahdin from previous peaks and had guessed where it might be, though we had never been sure. The following morning provided us with a view that defied any doubts. It was a searingly bright and blue day as we pitched up to the edge of Pema Dumkuk Lake, with the track passing within a few feet of the water. This opened up an unobstructed view of Katahdin to our left, still nearly 50 miles of walking away from us. It is hard to overstate our excitement, and we posed for pictures with one another, as if to confirm that the end was clearly in reach. The four of us were joined by another few hikers. Everybody quietened down as the reality of our imminent success gripped us. The fact that our target seemed to be increasing in size as we got closer didn't appear to put any of us off. We sped on to Namakanta Lake with adrenaline infusing each step. The flat terrain allowed us to reach this beautiful lake earlier than usual and, having set up camp a few feet back in the woods, we hung out on the stones beside the lake, enjoying the afternoon sun as it dropped slowly out of sight to the west. I was mesmerised by the peace of the place. I sat for over an hour on a rock thinking about my time on the trail as well as my hopes for my return to Diane. My inner thoughts concerning my marriage a few nights previously had allowed me some peace, so I could only look forward with positivity. I knew the challenges were there and I knew I'd still have my moments of doubt. On the plus side, I also knew that I'd found my person, as Diane often referred to me. Having put a lot of groundwork into finding the right one, I certainly didn't want to start the interview process again. Namakanta turned out to be one of my favourite campsites, because all doubt was now extinguished, at least in my mind. We were going to finish as a team. There were no major hurdles in front of us, other than Katahdin, of course. All I expected out of the hike was that I'd get a shot at climbing Katahdin, and we would all be doing this together in a few days' time. As we left Namakanta the following morning, the path took us out of the woods for about 200 yards, leading us along the beach around the lake for that short distance. I savoured this unexpected treat before a white blaze took us back into the woods, where we stayed for most of the day. On the way, we passed several lakes, then stumbled upon a couple of moose. It was a mother and a calf. Sadly, I wasn't able to grab my camera in time to record these two, suddenly emerging from the bushes about 25 yards ahead of us. We watched, open-mouthed in my case, as they sauntered back into the woods to continue their assault on the limitless leaves. Seeing the majesty of such animals in their own, very comfortable environment is humbling and reduces humans to awestruck onlookers. Having started my hike with the view that any animal encounters would have to be endured, I was now eagerly experiencing them as the very essence of excitement on the trail. We were lucky that evening to find almost as great a spot as Namakanta, setting up at Rainbow Spring Campsite, a little further back into the woods, but with an easy stroll to the lake. Soon we were joined by about a dozen others. We all gathered to watch the sun go down from the small opening by the lake, scattered around on the rocks with everybody lost in his or her own thoughts. Following morning, I got there early with nobody for company. I filmed as the sun pulled itself up to light the trees on the opposite bank. I had been appreciating my light show alone, but was glad to see Lydenot as he joined me for breakfast. We sat there in companionable silence, with both our destination and home beckoning in our immediate futures. It was now Saturday morning. We were all feeling the anticipation of Monday's climb, though we were growing concerned about the weather forecast. We had been appreciating the beauty of the past few weeks, but were now ready to go home. We were also keenly aware that Monday was forecast to let us down with a 50% chance of rain. It was especially disappointing since we had been treated to cloudless weather for most of the week. Indeed, both Saturday and Sunday were expected to continue in this vein. The walk out of the wilderness to the deeply unattractive Abel Bridge was easy and mainly flat. However, a wonderful trip across Rainbow Ledges gave us another glorious shot of our goal. Much to our later amusement, T-Bird and I spent the previous ten minutes believing that we had identified Katahdin a short distance further back. A few minutes later we realised that we had been looking at precisely the wrong direction. The real thing, when we saw it, couldn't be mistaken. I'm not sure if it was the anticipation of the finish or the accumulative effect of my 45 falls, but I was struggling on what should have been an easy day. When I mentioned this to Leidenot, he felt exactly the same, so we presumed it to be the former. By this time we both felt very emotional and our inner turmoil appeared to be having a detrimental effect upon our physical well-being. 
These feelings may seem silly to some of you, but they were real and disconcerting when they hit us. To do what the two of us were doing required a lot of commitment and not all of it was from us. Our families had endured our hikes from a distance, worried more than us, and they were equally looking forward to our return. I think we may have relaxed a little in anticipation of home, then found that the hiking became tougher as a result. Whatever it was, we descended from the beautiful rainbow ledges and were finally out of the 100-mile wilderness. The fact that we had slack-packed for half the wilderness didn't bother me a jot. I would highly recommend others to do the same. The only real attraction from Abel Bridge, apart from a beautiful shot of Katahdin from the bridge itself, is the fact that there is a campsite and a restaurant. We set up at the designated site next to a wide river within 100 yards of the restaurant. It was a great spot. Leidnot and I demolished burgers for both lunch and dinner. With only one more evening before we climbed to our intended destiny, we weren't going to waste one of the last opportunities to eat disgracefully. I had left it too late to take advantage of the shower that evening, so I hurried into it at 5.30 the following morning. Unfortunately, once I had stripped naked, I was completely unable to make my chosen shower work. Gathering up my clothes, soap and towel, I darted across the room to the other shower before failing miserably to get any action from that one as well. I stood there, somewhat bemused as to what I had done wrong. Then, as with every fall, I just got on with it. I shrugged, pulled my filthy clothes back onto my filthy body, then returned to back my tent. There was simply nothing I could do about it. Consequently, my trip up Katahdin was going to take place with the added weight of several days' worth of accumulated sweat and grime with a commensurately filthy shirt. Having started my trip six months previously with a selfie as a defence mechanism, I was ending it with a shrug for the same purpose. I presume that was progress of a sort. The traditional camping site for the night before the climb is in Baxter State Park at the Katahdin Stream campground. With just a flat ten miles to go from Abel Bridge, we took our time, even detouring to another pond where we had a stupendous view of our goal. We were sitting on rocking chairs at the Daisy Pond Visitor Centre, allowing ourselves to be intimidated by the brooding silence of Katahdin. I'm not sure how the others were feeling, but I was trying to stay calm and in the moment. Arriving at the campground, there was a palpable excitement around us. Hikers were on their way down from that day's ascent. We greeted them as enthusiastically as heroes returning from combat. Everybody was high-fiving as they passed by, celebrating their epic achievement. By now, we all had a huge mutual respect. We were delighted to see our fellow hikers achieving what we were hoping to match in 24 hours' time. Then, it would be our turn, but this was their time. Trillium's partner, John, had arranged a lean-to for the two of them. It was a mini-shelter that was bookable for a fee. Leidenot had been met by his wife, Deb, and his mother, the indomitable Mama Jean. They were going into Millinocket for the night. Trillium and John graciously allowed T-Bird and me to pitch our tents outside their lean-to. We were in a great position to greet and talk to the hikers as they returned with their stories of the day's climb. Unfortunately, just as dusk was upon us, a ranger came by to tell us that we weren't allowed to camp there. Even though we were in nobody's way, we had to move about 20 yards farther down. For that privilege, we were also charged $15 each to camp in this new spot. Despite getting particularly British on him, he wasn't to be moved. I had to accept the inevitable, so I dragged my already erected tent to a new site. I was not happy. Earlier, the same ranger had taken my registration to climb the mountain. He had recorded me as the 699th successful thru-hiker of the year. While I liked the concept of being a successful thru-hiker, it seemed a bit premature to me. He told us that between 3,000 and 4,000 hikers had started in Georgia, but numbers weren't finalised. It eventually transpired that there were an estimated 2,500 starters from Georgia in 2014, of which 653 completed their hike, while the Sobos had 242 starters, with 76 climbing the scrubby little track that finished at Springer. I could not have been more delighted that I had chosen to start at Springer. I felt strongly, as I still do, that the Katahdin finish was the icing on a very substantial cake. I would find this to be true the following morning, though I felt it strongly even before I started my final climb. That night, I was unable to sleep too much and sat up in my tent to contemplate what I was about to achieve. Funnily enough, one of the things that mattered to me most in those moments was the fact that my son, Rob, was going to accept my trail name, Mighty Blue. He had insisted, not unreasonably, that I couldn't claim to be Mighty before I had actually taken the step. He had already started calling me Almost Mighty Blue for a couple of weeks, so I knew that I was on the right track. 
His acceptance of my name was suddenly dreadfully important to me. I also thought of what I was going to do when I returned to Florida. I had the luxurious feeling of not knowing and being entirely open to anything that might come my way. That said, my return to Florida panned out in totally unexpected ways that I'm glad I didn't know that night. Above all, of course, I was anticipating my return to Diane and getting on with our lives. Stepping outside of your marriage, albeit with your partner's blessing and support, is a strange thing to happen in a strong marriage. I will always be grateful for her buy-in to my adventure. Whatever challenges we were going to face in the coming months and years could only be addressed once I was home. For now, all I could think about was seeing her lovely face.